Once people achieve their aim, suddenly there's a battle internally to take control of the, of the spoils. And you have to remember, for example, in Libya, some of the rebels who have done so well, and in some cases have impressed us in this country, some of those people, before the revolution started, would not have been caught sitting at the same table as their brothers in arms. But it's a marriage of convenience. The question is, how long does it last? And history also shows that these issues of leadership, especially when so many factions have waited so long for a place at the table, these issues of leadership can torment a nation. And these days, in this modern era of, of, of communication and transportation and otherwise, those problems can spill over those borders and ultimately have impact on the lives we live here in the Western Hemisphere. It's always worth repeating, the goals of people in other cultures, while they may be perceived as being in the best interest of their nation, are not necessarily our goals, are not necessarily in sync with our standards. Or put differently, to say it maybe for the last time, we'll see. They don't all want the same things we want. One more note of caution. Middle East populations may not like their rulers, but when it comes to assisting in the transition from one regime to another, as you probably all well understand, the United States is widely viewed with deep animosity, at the very least with suspicion. So that limits our influence. And we have to tread very carefully. And I'm just glad I'm not the guy responsible for figuring out where to put the next step. Now, before I leave the Islamic world, I want to tell you a little anecdote. Uh, because somebody reminded me of it the other day. It's, it's a story from my book, which is called, by the way, I should promote the book, Life in the Wrong Lane. Because that's where I've spent a lot of my life. And the story is about the recently deposed Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. who And, and it doesn't shed light on the future of Libya. <laughs> or the mistakes he made. It's just a fun story. It's not the most fun story in the book. The most fun story in the book, according to readers, is about the night I surrendered to a cow. <laughs> but this is a story about Gaddafi. There had been a couple of terrorist attacks, two different European airports. In both cases, they were US airlines. I think they were TWA. It's nice to talk to an audience that remembers what TWA was. <laughs> and terrorists shot up lines of people who were queuing to get their tickets to board these two different uh, flights in these two different airports on US airlines. And immediately, President Reagan, in retrospect, probably rightly so, pointed the finger at Libya and said, it's Colonel Gaddafi. So we rushed down there. We, well, I was somewhere else in Europe. And with the camera crew, we got a charter plane. We got there. And then they shut it down to Western journalists. We were the only ones there for several days. And I put in a request. I, as, as I had done before, I knew the drill. Uh, with the minister of such and such, I want to interview the leader. And the response always was, OK, good. Go sit in your hotel. Wait till we call you. Could be six hours, could be six days. And maybe the third or fourth day, as memory serves, and memory serves less effectively every year, I got a call in the middle of the night, literally the middle of the night. And it was from some Libyan official who said to me in English, have your crew waiting at 4 o'clock in the morning Transportation will be waiting for you. We're going to take you on a tour of the antiquities. I have seen every antiquity on both sides of the Mediterranean. Had zero interest, but it was just too strange. So I thought, well, I'll go. Just see what it's about. And then I thought, well, if I'm there and something good happens, I need the crew. So I called the guys. I apologized. We were outside at 4 in the morning. And a yellow school bus rolls up. We get in. There were three or four Libyan journalists sitting way in the back. And we start driving through Tripoli. And I'm still tired. I got the call. I never got back to sleep. I fall asleep. The cameraman shakes me awake at a certain point. We have come to a stop. We're out in front of a field. It has rained the night before. There's mud. And there's a flanks of tractors heading away from us. Flanks, meaning five tractors. And we could see, you know, I kind of blinked that adjacent to the lead tractor, there happened to be a couple of men on each side running along with machine guns. Now, I've never seen that in Iowa. So we thought, <laughs> must be him. So we pile out of the bus. We go running across this muddy field, losing our footing from time to time. I'm carrying the sticks, the, uh, the tripod. Cameraman has this big, heavy camera, and the sound man has a big, heavy piece of gear. And we get there, and we're out of breath. And we get up to the lead tractor, and of course, it's Gaddafi. And I've, I've met him a couple of times before at this point, but it's Gaddafi. 
and we stop, and I'm out of breath, as is the crew, and so I decide I'll just make small talk until they can get set up, catch their breath, I can catch mine, and then we'll do the real interview about these terrorist attacks a couple of days earlier. And so he stops, acts surprised. He's wearing, by the way, what I remember characterizing it. We did a piece for the David Brinkley Sunday show. This was a Sunday morning, this week with David Brinkley. And I said he was dressed in something I can only describe as a Pierre Cardin opera ski suit. I mean, it was a bizarre thing, but he was a bizarre man. Um, and it probably was, was, was coated head to toe with, with, uh, with uh, bulletproof mesh. But nevertheless, I stopped. And just to make small talk while the crew's catching its breath and getting set up, I said, what are you doing, Colonel Gaddafi? He says, I am tilling the fields for the people. <laughs> and I said, do you do this a lot? He says, oh, yes, all the time I till the fields for the people. And at about this point, the cameraman signals me, we're ready. Let's get it done. And so I said, Colonel, the engine is still churning. You can barely hear, and I know we've got to turn. I said, Colonel Gaddafi, would you please turn off the tractor? It's, by the way, a Canadian Massey Ferguson tractor. And I said, can you turn off the tractor? And he says, oh, yes, of course. And he starts fumbling around for the key, and to save his life, he can't find it. This man who tills the fields for the people all the time. And one of his bodyguards, embarrassed on the behalf of Gaddafi, leans over and turns it off for him. And he said, oh, yes, I, I always forget where that key goes. It's not enough with all the politicians and journalists and commentators on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, they get off a plane in some distant land and they go and meet with pre-selected politicians and commentators and others in some distant society. And then they get back on the plane with the same shiny shoes they had on when they landed. That doesn't work. When you go to countries like that, where things are so different, where you can't begin to believe you can possibly understand such a foreign culture, you've got to not just get your, your, your boots dirty. You've got to sink them in the mud to understand just how different some people are from others. Now, I want to show you part of a second program now. Are you queued up for this? OK. It dates back a few years, but it, it hopefully illustrates for you the point. It dates back to the funeral of Yasser Arafat in Ramallah, the capital of the Palestinian West Bank. And as you watch, bear in mind why I'm showing it to you, to illustrate a couple of points. Uh, first, that there is a vacuum and an ongoing perpetual vacuum of popular leadership and self-discipline in that part of the world. And secondly, it is a world that lives with constant and inescapable chaos. So these are as big a barrier as any, in my opinion, to uh, peace in the Middle East. I don't believe, from my own time in Afghanistan, that it's a, a, a society where a civilized structure can take root. There's nothing against the, the, the levels of intelligence or even education in Afghanistan. It's the nature of that society. I don't think they can take root. And I don't have to tell you any more than the fact, by the way, that I saw men playing the game of polo on horses using the severed heads of their enemies as their balls. The mistake I think we make in Afghanistan, the mistake we make in much of the world, and have made for many years under many political administrations, by the way, Republicans and Democrats, is that in trying to mediate conflicts and in trying especially to quell terrorism, we operate as if the people we're dealing with want the same things we want. I've already said this. They don't. 